Hi guys, Dane here, and I have a Biggie down here today, and he's sitting on the book that I want to review, aren't you, Biggie? Do you mind me? Excuse me, buddy. Oh, bub, 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 bub. Can I have this book that you're literally sat right dead center on? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so today I'm going to be talking about The Long Earth by Terry Pratchett and Stephen Baxter. And I might as well tell you now, this is going to be the long review, because I don't know if you can see here, but I tabbed out a lot of stuff that I want to talk about. I'll read you the blurb first. 1917, the Western Front. Private Percy Blakeney wakes up. He is lying on fresh spring grass. He can hear birdsong and the wind in the leaves and the trees. Where have the mud, blood and blasted landscape of no man's land gone? 2015, Madison, Wisconsin. Cop Monica, Jans Cop Monica Jansen is exploring the burned out home of a reclusive, some say mad, others dangerous, scientist, when she finds a curious gadget, a box containing some wiring, a three-way switch and a potato. It is the prototype of an invention that will change the way mankind views its world forever. And that's an understatement if, there ever, if ever there is one. Now, I think that's an awful blurb because that's the only blurb for this I've ever seen and it put me off reading it for ages. Uh, mainly because I don't like books that hop backwards and forwards through time, which this book doesn't do. So, <laughs> it's a really odd blurb. Basically what this book is actually about, that invention that's mentioned on the rear, uh, the like schematics are released to the general public and everyone can use it, and it allows you to hop through different versions of the Earth. So, our, ver our version of Earth is called Datum, and you can imagine it like a stack of cards. So you can either go one card up in the deck or one card below, but you can only go one hop at a time. And uh, these start to be known as West and East, even though those are kind of arbitrary directions. And our Earth is the only one that's been colonised with our kind of history. So you hop one Earth left, and suddenly you're in the middle of a forest. And so this kind of has all sorts of implications. For example, you know, at the moment we're dealing with overpopulation. Well, suddenly, if we can just hop to a different Earth, then we're not, you know global warming is no longer a problem we have people right at the beginning like there's a gold rush where people go over and bring loads of gold back but it's obviously a false economy because as soon as people start doing that gold floods the market and then suddenly gold is worthless and we have some really interesting exam like examinations of what would happen in our world were this to be invented so for, what, for example one of the early things is terrorism terrorists use it they hop to an adjacent world they find their way into the middle of where the houses of parliament would be and then hop back and so, uh, yeah, there's some really interesting stuff there. I should also, also mention as well, uh, you can't take iron between the worlds. So then that also kind of slows the pace of development. And also you have people say they're going to build a colony on Earth 1000 West. But they have to step there world by world and it takes a long time. So it might take them three months of stepping to get to that world. So there's some really interesting ideas here. I'm going to go through and check out some of the uh, little tabs that I made. And so we do start off with this bit that's mentioned on the rear, this p uh, private Percy Blakeney. He's not really an important character, in, except that he is. He's, uh, you know, his tale is told later on and it's used to explain the way that the different Long Earths inter interrelate with each other. And uh, it ties back in as well with some of the creatures that they meet throughout their travels. But I thought it was an interesting way to start the book as well, you know? So uh, Private Percy, he's trying to figure out where he is, and he says, Daylight, but where? Well, France. It had to be France. Percy couldn't have been blown very far by the shell that had knocked him out. This must still be France. But here he was in woods where woods shouldn't be. And without the traditional sounds of France, such as the thunder of the guns and the screams of the men. Uh, we have uh, here as well an expert, Professor Wotan Ulm of Oxford University, talking to the BBC. And this is him trying to explain what is happening with the, the many worlds. The truth is that we are as baffled by the phenomenon as Dante would have been if he'd suddenly been given a glimpse of Hubble's expanding universe. Even the language we use to describe it is probably no more correct than the pack of cards analogy. Even the language we use to describe it is probably no more correct than the pack of cards analogy that most people feel at home with. The Long Earth is a large pack of three-dimensional sheets, stacked up in a higher dimensional space, each card an Earth entire unto itself. And, most significantly, to most people, the Long Earth is open. Almost anybody can travel up and down the pack, drilling, as it were, through the cards themselves. People are expanding into all that room. Of course they are. This is a primal instinct. We plains apes still fear the leopard in the dark. If, he sp if we spread out, he cannot take all of us. So we meet some AI, except it's not really AI. Uh, he's called Lobsang, and as we meet him, he's in a vending machine. And um, he's called 
yeah, as I say, he's called Lobsang, and he's talking to our other main character, Joshua Valiente. And he goes, Lobsang who? I have no surname. In old Tibet, only aristocrats and living Buddhas had surnames, Joshua. I have no such pretensions. Are you a computer? Why do you ask? Because I'm damn sure there isn't a human being in there, and besides, you talk funny. Mr. Valiente, I am more articulate and better spoken than anybody you know, and indeed, I am not inside the drinks machine. Well, not wholly, that is. Stop teasing the man, Lobsang, said Selina, turning to Joshua. Mr. Valiente, I know you were elsewhere when the world first heard about Lobsang. He is unique. He is a computer, physically, but he used to be, how can I put this, a Tibetan motorcycle repairman. So how did he get from Tibet to the inside of a drinks machine? That is a long story, Mr. Valiente, which uh, we will cover in a minute. So basically, he proved that he was uh, that he was human, as well as being a drinks machine. Well, Joshua, he had them by the shorts. Reincarnation is still a cornerstone of world faith. And Lobsang simply said that he had reincarnated as a computer program, as was deposited in evidence in court. I'll show you the transcripts if you like. The relevant software initiated at precisely the microsecond a Larson motorcycle repairman with a frankly unpronounceable name died. To a, to a discarnate soul, 20,000 teraflops worth of technological wizardry on a gel substrate apparently looks identical to a few pounds of soggy brain tissue. A number of expert witnesses testified to the astonishing accuracy of Lobsang's flashes of recall of his previous life. And I myself witnessed a small, wiry old man with a face like a dried peach, a distant cousin of the repairman, conversing with Lobsang happily for several hours, reminiscing about the good old days in Lhasa. A, conf a charming afternoon. So, and then uh, Joshua says, why? What could he gain out of it? And Lobsang says, I'm right here. What did I gain? Civil rights, security, the right to own property. And switching you off would be murder. It would. Also physically impossible, incidentally, but let's not go into that. And interestingly enough, I was writing for a client recently about the differences between AI and humans, and specifically in terms of like empathy and love. And then for that, I referred back to this, because there's this theory that the first thing any self-aware computer would do would be to make sure that it could never be shut down, uh, because it would know vulnerability, it would know a sense of self, and it would know that it could no longer have this sense of self. Uh, then at some point they are in uh, one of the different, you know, one of the different worlds and uh, this character called Sarah says, where are we? Uh, somewhere else, I guess, you know, like Narnia, which is interesting because I've just been reading Narnia. The moonlight showed him the tears pouring down her face and the snot under her nose and he could smell the vomit on her nightdress. I never stepped into no wardrobe. Because basically Joshua, who is our main character in this, is kind of a natural at stepping, be stepping between the worlds. But when the uh, the ability to step first comes out, people don't really know what they're doing. And so he's sort of rescuing people, basically rescuing the other kids from his because uh, he, he, he's been raised in a home with nuns. And then, as we heard from the cover, Jansen investigates uh, seeming arson at the uh, place where the guy who invented the the, uh, the stepper came from. And I'm going to read these few little bits, little paragraphs out. So now Jansen found Lindsay's own stepper, the prototype, presumably. It was in the living room, sitting on the mantelpiece above a fire that hadn't been lit in decades. Maybe he'd purposefully left it behind to be found. The forensics guys had seen it and abandoned it, heavily dusted for prints. It would probably be taken into store once the crime scene was broken down. Jansen bent to inspect it. It was just a clear plastic box, a cube, about four inches on a side. Forensics thought the box might once have contained antique three and a half inch floppy disks. Lindsay was evidently the kind of man who kept junk like that. Through the clear walls you could see electrical components, capacitors and resistors and relays and coils, connected with twisted and soldered copper wire. There was a big three-way switch on the lid, the positions labelled by hand with a black marker pen. West. Off. East. And there's actually a schematic for it at the beginning of the book as well. The whole thing's powered by a potato. So here you go, here you can see if you want to build one of your own. And then Jansen meets Joshua. So we have here uh, this, this first meeting, I think it's great. And again, this is important because most people when they first step, or every time they step it makes them vomit. And Joshua, because he's kind of a natural, doesn't have that effect. Joshua backed away from the cop. You are Joshua, aren't you? I can tell, you're the one kid that isn't dribbling vomit. He said nothing. They tell me Joshua saved them. They tell me you picked them up and carried them back home. You're a regular catcher in the rye. You ever read that book? You should. Although maybe it's banned in the home. And there are quite a lot of different references both to books and that kind of thing, but also to pop culture and pop science throughout this, which really made it a joy to read. Again, it feels like everything had been thought of. 
So we have this character called Jim Russo who keeps on trying to like basically take advantage of the opportunities that the Long Earth opens up and it keeps backfiring. So for, uh, for example here he's gone off to try and get some gold and uh, someone says to him, what is it with people like you? You kind of think we'll move ahead but not the next or the next. You figured out there's unmined gold on this spot. Sure there is, you're right. But what about the same site on West 6 and 7 and 8 and as far out as you can go? What about all the other guys just like you, out there panning the streams on all those stepwise worlds? You didn't think of that, did you? My friend, everyone else has had the same idea. Then the woman adds, Oh, don't be too hard on him, Mac. He'll make some money if he moves fast. Gold hasn't been totally devalued yet. Well, gold isn't worth its weight in gold anymore. And then we have this little reference here to Robinson Crusoe, which I really enjoy because I, I read Robinson Crusoe not too long ago and actually really enjoyed reading it as well. So this is the uh, start of chapter 8. People had gone off every which way in those early days, with a purpose or just for the hell of it, but nobody had gone further than Joshua. In those first months, still aged only 13, 14, he'd built himself refuges in the higher earths. Stockades, he called them. And the best of them were stockades, like Robinson Crusoe's. People had the wrong idea about Robinson Crusoe. The popular image was of a determined, cheerful man heavily into goatskin underwear. But at the home had been an old, battered copy of the book itself, and Joshua, being Joshua, had read it from cover to cover. Robinson Crusoe had been on his island for over 26 years and had spent most of the time building stockades. Joshua approved of this. The man obviously had his head screwed on right. We have this little reference here, so there is a, a drug that's been developed uh, because basically because people get nausea after stepping, so it says here. But nobody had been able to do anything about the nausea that incapacitated most people for 10 or 15 minutes after a step. There was a drug that was supposed to help, but Jansen always tried to avoid becoming dependent on drugs, and besides, it turned your piss blue. I want to read this little bit as well, where we get a little bit of explanation of kind of what happened after stepping became common. So he had a tough first few days. Those missing kids, and the one that came back with broken bones from falling through high-rise buildings, or with chunks bitten out of them by some critter or other. Prison escapes. A wave of absenteeism from the schools, businesses, the public services. The economy took an immediate hit, nationwide, even globally. Did you know that? I'm told it was like an extra Thanksgiving break before the assholes drifted back to work, or most of them. Jansen nodded. Most of those first day steppers had come quickly back. Some had not. The poor tended to be more likely to stay away. Rich people had more to give up back in Dayton. So out of cities like Mumbai and Lagos, even a few American cities, flocks of street kids had stepped, bewildered, unequipped into wild worlds but worlds that didn't already belong to somebody else, so why shouldn't they belong to you? The American Red Cross and other agencies had sent care teams after them to sort out the Lord of the Flies chaos that followed. And then one of the things, the limitations of stepping is that iron can't go from world to world, and the authors have thought of that as well, so we get this little, uh, this little exchange. I'll tell you what puzzles even a doofus like me, Jansen. I thought we all got iron in our blood or something. How come that doesn't get left behind? In your blood, the iron's chemically bound up in organic molecules. Inside your haemoglobin, one molecule at a time. Iron molecules can go over if they are in chemical compounds like that, just not in the form of metal. Why, rust can be carried over, because that's a compound of iron with water and oxygen. You can't take your piece over, sir, except for all the rust on the shaft. He eyed her. That isn't some kind of lewd remark, is it, Jansen? We have a little bit more on the nature of Lobsang and the AI here, so uh, he's having a conversation with Joshua. Joshua hesitated. While you're thanking me, maybe you could answer a question. Is this you, Lobsang, or are you back on the datum in some store at MIT? Is that a meaningful question? Oh, certainly it is meaningful. Joshua, back on the datum, I am distributed across many memory stores and processor banks. That's partly for security and partly for efficiency and effectiveness of data retrieval and processing. If I wished, I could consider myself to be distributed among a number of centers of foci of consciousness. But I am human, I am Lobsang. I remember how it was to look out of a cave of bone from a single apparent locus of consciousness. And that is how I have maintained it. There is only one me, Joshua, only one Lobsang, though I have backup memory stores scattered over several worlds. And that me is with you on this journey. I am fully dedicated to the mission. And by the way, when I inhabit the ambulant unit, that too, for the duration, is me. Though there remains enough of me outside that shell to enable the airship to fly. If I were to fail or were lost, then a backup copy on Datum Earth would be initiated and synced with whatever you were able to retrieve of my memory stores on the ship. But that would be another Lobsang. He would remember me, but he would not be me. I hope that's clear. By the way, the Datum is what they start to call our Earth, the Earth that everything originated from. 
We also have a conversation between Joshua and Lobsang where we get another look or another explanation of how the Long Earths all interact with each other. So where is this world, this particular Earth? It's in exactly the same space and time as Datum Earth. It's like another mode of vibration of a single guitar string. The only difference is that now we can visit it. We couldn't even detect it before. That's pretty much the best answer Trans Earth's tame physicists can supply. I also think it's really interesting how, as we go through the other worlds, we see different sort of species of wildlife, and um, we get like the evolutionary basis for that here. So, Joshua heard a rumble, a splashing sound, a kind of shrill trumpet. He turned slowly. Evidently, he wasn't alone on this world. A short distance inland, he glimpsed a scene of predator and prey. A cat-like creature with fangs so heavy it could barely lift its head, it seemed, was tracking a waddling beast with a hide like a tank. These were the first animals he had seen on this world. Lobsang saw what he saw. The overarmed in pursuit of the overarmored, the result of an evolutionary arms race, and one that has played out on Datum Earth many times, in various contexts, until both parties succumb to extinction, all the way back to the dinosaur age and beyond. A universal, it seems. As on the Datum, so on the Long Earth. Coming up to a good halfway through, really, we tie back in to Private Percy, who is the soldier who was mentioned right at the start. And it does tie in nicely with the story, but um, it's worth the wait. I just don't know whether I would have included that at all on the, on the rear cover, you know? And so, obviously, Private Percy is still recovering from the aftermath of this uh, shell going off. And he's thinking about boots. So uh, I'm going to read these couple of paragraphs. Boots! So his sleepy brain reminded him. They were the thing. Look after your boots and your boots would look after you. He had always spent a lot of time thinking about his boots. At this point it occurred to Private Percy, walking slowly, still somewhat battered by his war and adrift in time and space, to wonder if he still had any legs on which to hang those boots. You could lose your legs and not know until the shock wore off, or so he had been told. It was like poor old Mac who never knew his feet had gone until he tried to stand up. He remembered walking around this forest, of course he did, but maybe that was all a dream as like as not, and maybe he was back in the mud and the blood after all. And so he tried gingerly to pull himself upright, and was cheered by the realisation that at least he appeared to have both hands. Shifting gently, he moved his aching body until he could rise enough to see, yes, boots! Blessed boots! And then we learn a bit more about the boots, but also how brutal, I guess, life in the trenches could be and what they had to rely on to survive, so... They could be treacherous, could boots, just like legs. Like the time when a 40-pounder hit a box of ammunition and he was part of the detail that had to go and sort things out. The sergeant had been a bit quiet and uncharacteristically soothing when Percy was in distress because, even though he found a boot lying in the churned up mud, he couldn't find a man's leg to go with said boot. And the sergeant had said, patting Percy on the shoulder, Well, lad, seeing as he has no head either, I reckon he won't notice, don't you? Just stick to doing what I told you, lad. Pay books, watches, letters, anything that can identify the poor sods. And then stick them looking up over the top of the trench. Yes, lad, stick those dead bodies up there. They might take a bullet, but as sure as salvation, they won't feel anything where they've gone, and there will be one less, and there will be one bullet less for you or me. And then we discover that basically uh, Percy was rescued by one of what they call the trolls. These are like the life forms that inhabit various other versions of the Long Earth, and um, so Lobsang describes them as this. It says. Uh, trolls seems the mythological term that best describes these creatures, extrapolating from legends that must derive from even older sightings. Creatures glimpsed in our world only to vanish again, entirely misunderstood. The seeds of legend, a term that already has become current in some parts of the Long Earth, Joshua. So a lot of our legends could potentially come from these creatures stepping through our world on the way to somewhere else. We also have a bit where uh, Lobsang's trying to be a smart ass and uses the word tracklements and he says to uh, Joshua, I bet you've never heard of them before. And Joshua says, Tracklements are those things which complement the main ingredient of a meal and, traditionally at least, may be found in the vicinity of the said ingredient. For example, horseradish root in good beef country. We also have this uh, terrifying story of... Um, well, I'll just read it out, basically, uh, about a thief and a ne'er-do-well known locally as Passover. He was a stepper, wasn't he? said Joshua flatly, and I just bet that there was no other entrance to the cave. For a moment, he imagined the drip of icy water oozing over bleeding fingers in the darkness, a man trying to scrabble his way out of a cave like a coffin. So maybe he'd had a few drinks. Sister Serendipity once told me that Somerset cider was made of lead, apples and hand sores. He lost his bearings, stepped ended up in his small cave without even knowing that he'd stepped at all, which would of course make him even more disorientated. He tried to feel his way out, banged his head, knocked himself out. So yeah, like, 
Not everyone who steps can control their ability to step, and sometimes it leads to these awful situations like that where you step to your death. So I've already mentioned how basically iron can't be taken between the, the long earths and that kind of creates this interesting thing where uh, you know like guns and other inventions can't be taken and one of the characters here, Cliche, a practical man, just nodded. At least we know the rules. Kind of a gut wrench for most Americans to have gun control suddenly opposed on them, however. Then we sort of see what's happening in the United Kingdom where I live and this is just a little exchange which I think sums up the situation. Surely, Prime Minister, we could just ban stepping. It is a manifest security risk. Geoffrey, we might as well outlaw breathing. Even my own mother has stepped. But the population is fleeing. The inner cities are ghost towns. The economy is collapsing. We must do something. Then the conversation progresses to them saying, then there should be license. Stepper boxes. The long earth is a sink as far as the blessed economy is concerned. But penalising the use of the boxes you need to access it would yield some tax revenue at least. Oh, don't be absurd, man. The Prime Minister sat back in his chair. Come on, we can't just ban a thing because we can't control it. The Minister responsible for health and safety looked startled. I don't see why not. It's never stopped us before. Very true. We have um, this little bit of dialogue between Joshua and Lobsang, where Lobsang says, You like to be far from the maddening crowd, Joshua, don't you? Thomas Hardy's title was about the Madden crowd. Oh, of course it was. But it's a good idea for me to make the odd little slip, not to appear all-knowing every now and again. And I must say, I've seen a few people on booktube call it far from the maddening crowd, and I find it maddening. I'm going to read these two little paragraphs as well, because I think these are really fascinating sort of little looks into the nature of artificial intelligence. Apparently, so it was believed, Lobsang resided in extremely high-density, fast-access computer storage at MIT, and therefore not in the premises of TransEarth at all. When Joshua read that, he felt a warm certainty that whatever was in a super cool box in MIT, it wasn't Lobsang, not the whole of Lobsang. If Lobsang was smart, and he was most surely smart, he would have got himself distributed everywhere, a hedge against an off switch, and he'd be in a position where nobody could command him, not even his super powerful partner Douglas Black. There was somebody who knew the rules, Joshua thought. Was Lobsang human, or an AI aping humanity? A smiley, he thought. One curve and two dots, and you see a human face. What was the minimum you needed to see a human being? What has to be said? What has to be laughed? After all, people are made of nothing but clay. Well, metaphorically. Although Joshua was not too good at metaphors, seeing them as a kind of trick. And you had to admit that Lobsang was pretty good at knowing what Joshua was thinking, just as a perceptive human would be. Maybe the only significant difference between a really smart simulation and a human being was the noise they made when you punched them. Then we have a big airship is created, uh, which kind of has Lobsang on board it, and it's used to go on an expedition, crossing, you know, thousands and thousands of uh, steps away from our Earth. And uh, they call it the Mark Twain, which I think is very cool. I'm going to read this little bit that explains how it works as well. Oh no, I am wired into the airship systems. The whole ship will be my body in a sense. Joshua, I will be carrying you. Only sentient creatures can step. Yes, and I, like you, am sentient. And Joshua understood. The airship was Lobsang, or at least his body. When Lobsang stepped, the airship carcass came with him, just as Joshua carried over his body, his clothes, whenever he stepped. And that was how an airship could step. Lobsang was smug and boastful. Of course, this would not work were I not sentient. This is further proof of my claims of personhood, isn't it? I've already trialled the technology. Well, you know that. I traced your earlier expedition, as I told you. Or rather thrilling, isn't it? I like this little detail as well about what's happening uh, as people sort of expand into the Long Earths. Of course, it's intellectually interesting that most Americans choose to go west, even though that's just an arbitrary label with no reference to geographical west. Similarly, I heard that most Chinese emigrants are heading east. Then uh, we get a little glimpse into the role that books play in this sort of futuristic new world. So I'm going to read these couple paragraphs. Richmond West 10's only bookseller exulted with every sale he made to the would-be pioneers who passed through here. Books printed on paper, every one of them. Dead tree technology. Information that, if carefully stored, would last for millennia. And no batteries required. It ought to be on an ad hoarding, he thought. If Humphrey Llewellyn III could have his way, every book ever written would be treasured, at least one copy bound in sheepskin and illuminated by monks, or specifically by naked nuns, his predilection being somewhat biased in that direction. So now, he hoped, here was a chance to bring mankind back into the book-loving fold. He gloated. 
There was still no electronics in the pioneer worlds, was there? Where was your internet? Ha! Where was Google? Where was your mother's old Kindle? Your iPad 25? Where was Wikipedia? Very primly, he always called it that, just to show his disdain. Very few people noticed. All gone, unbelievers. All those fancy toy gadgets stuffed in drawers, screens blank as the eyes of corpses left behind. I think this is quite touching, this relationship between Lobsang and Joshua. Lobsang said gently, I have something for you, which I suspect your mother would have liked you to have. He produced a small item wrapped in soft paper and laid it gently on the bench, downloading as he did so a number of recommended works on dealing with grief and the aftermath of loss, and all the while making background system checks of the ship. Joshua opened the packet cautiously. It contained his mother's cheap, precious plastic bracelet. Then Lobsang left Joshua alone. I like how this ties together as well. And, um... Because basically, we have sort of several different threads following different people doing different things on the Long Earths. And actually, this character here, by the time we start this book, The Long War, which is book two, Lobsang has married her. And at this point, I don't think they've even met. But we have read about her and her family. And she's only a kid at the time as well, because this one takes place like 15 years later. Whenever they stopped, Lobsang scanned for shortwave radio transmissions, which ought to carry around the curve of any Earth with an ionosphere. They paused at a couple of Corn Belt worlds to listen, one being West 101754, where they got a long and chatty news update from a colony in a stepwise New England. Some kid, originally from Madison as it happened, blogging by reading from her journal. One of a whole trail of such hopeful townships, Joshua imagined, scattered thin across the continents of the Long Earth. And each, he supposed, would have its own story to tell. And then, while we're reading from this extract from her journal, uh, she's saying, We had a big argument about what to call our new community. The adults had a meet about it, and it turned into the usual word fest. Melissa was determined it should be called some long uplifting name, like New Independence, or Deliverance, or maybe just New Hope. But my dad laughed at that one and made a joke about Star Wars. They eventually start calling it Reboot. And then her father writes an update because it's her birthday and she's busy off uh, celebrating, and so we read this. We were able to rely on help from outside. A family of Amish came our way, following a lead from the Reverend Heron, our itinerant preacher. Odd folk they are, but friendly enough, and very competent at what they do. Such as when they helped us set up our pottery kiln, which is a boxy oven with a chimney stack. Our pots are rough as hell, but you can't imagine the pride you get in setting a vase you made on a shelf you built, full of flowers you grew in the garden you dug out from the raw earth. And I just think it's cool that it makes sense, the Amish would be, they'd be like in high demand, because you've got to remember on these worlds, as people are exploring them, there's no technology. There's not even the way that they can import technology unless it's made without any iron components. And even then it takes people, like people have to physically step across the worlds to take the technology. And this world there on 101,754 or whatever, it took them months, if not like a year to get there. So when Amish people come along who are used to living without technology, it is a huge boon for any community. And uh, we, we go on here, so uh, the way we pay visitors like the Amish for their services is interesting, by the way. Well, I find it so. Money. What has worth out here in the long earth? What has value when every man can own his own gold mine? Interesting theoretical question when you think about it, isn't it? Among ourselves, we do use datum currencies. Since the long earth recession cut in, the yen and the US dollar have held up, especially since they are unforgeable. The British pound collapsed earlier when half the population fled from that crowded little island, including Franklin, our invaluable smith. Nevertheless, Britain, not for the first time, showed the way out of adversity. In their bad economic years, the Brits evolved the favour, a currency of flexible worth. In short, it was a unit notational coin whose value was agreed by the buyer and seller at the point of transaction, which made it rather difficult to tax, and so it worked very badly on the datum. But it's the ideal currency in the New Worlds, which is not surprising since the system was once used in the embryo United States of America, when there was no coin to be had and no effective government to validate its use even if there were. In places like Reboot, you see, your life is full of small trades. You boil animal fats and make tallow, and since you made too much, maybe your neighbour could use some, and indeed she could, and offers a pound of iron ore in return. That isn't very useful to you, but it certainly is to Franklin the Smith, and you hand it over to him in exchange for favour to be repaid at some future time. So you are now owed a favour, which might be something solid, or even an offer to bring back store-bought goods next time he has to go to 100k or the datum, or whatever. We have this little bit, a little insight into Britain as well and what's going on there. This was just a few years after Step Day. Gareth had spent a gap year summer in the US where they were talking about treks out to the remote worlds, of building an infinity of stepwise Americas, whereas in England it was all a kind of dull nothingness. The long earth just hadn't inspired John Bull. 
Of course, it didn't help that the stepwise Englands were uniformly choked with forest, but basically all you saw in England west or east was little rectangular plots cut into the forest, precisely mapping suburban back gardens where middle class families popped over to grow beans, or to catch the sunshine when it rained at home, or just occasionally to get savaged by a wild boar. And meanwhile, the disadvantaged, young and old, drifted away from the dole and their dead-end jobs and just vanished into the green, and the cities were dying from their empty inner suburbs outward, and the economy slowly crumbled. Britain doesn't get the best of things in, uh, in the long earth. Okay, I also think this is really cool as well. Uh, we have these things called jokers, which are basically worlds where they're just dead worlds, effectively. So, uh, embedded in the blandness of the corn belt were plenty of jokers. Here was a locust world. The airship appeared right in the middle of a flying plague of big heavy insects that battered briefly against the gondola walls. They lingered in one world where, Lobsang suspected, the Tibetan plateau, an accident of tectonic collision, had never formed. His aerial drones revealed that without the Himalayas, the climate of the whole of Central and Southern Asia, even Australia, was radically different. And there were worlds they couldn't understand at all. A world immersed in a perpetual crimson red dust storm, like a nightmare version of Mars. A world like a bowling ball, utterly smooth under a cloudless deep blue sky. And we also get loads of weird evolutions on these worlds as well, so for example here. Now a creature looking very much like a beefy ostrich appeared. A family of rhino-like beasts backed off nervously, but the bird stretched out its neck, opened its beak wired, and fired out a ball like a cannonball. This slammed into the ribcage of a big male rhino then that went down bellowing. The family scattered and the bird closed in to feed on the fallen male. And then we read how that's actually possible. Lobsang used an anaesthetic rifle mounted on the gondola to bring down the bird and sent down his ambulance unit to inspect it. The bird had a separate stomach sack which filled up with a mixture of feces, bones, gravel, bits of wood, other indigestibles. All this was mortared together with guano to make a large ball as hard as teak. And then we get a distress call from uh, the First Heavenly Church of the Cosmic Confidence Trick Victims. Joshua learned that while the mainstream religions remain concentrated on the low earths because of access to the holy sites on the datum, the Vatican, Metica, many splinter religious communities had gone out deep into the long earth, each seeking freedom of expression, as similar communities had done for millennia on earth. Such pilgrims would often choose places that in datum contexts were geographically remote too, like this one. On the distant earth they were still far to the east of the location of Moscow. And yet, even among these maverick groups, the cosmic confidence trick victims stood out as somewhat unusual. They consider their religion to reflect the truth about the universe, which is its essential absurdity. True victims believe that there is one born again every minute, and they must be fruitful and multiply to create more human minds to appreciate the joke. It says here there were fields marked by rows of stones. Lobsang pointed out a characteristic tint to some of the crops. Marijuana plants, acres of them, which told you a lot about the nature of this community. And there were corpses everywhere. And so we go in, and... Um, you know, me being me, I'm like, oh my god, it's a cult. It's like uh, Jonestown all over again. But no, it isn't. So, um, basically, there are all of these animals are fleeing eastward. And they have to figure out why. And uh, Joshua stepped back from the corpse and stood, eyes closed, imagining. We're on a hilltop, the highest point for a good way around. A dense forest is a difficult place to step in a hurry. If you wanted to flee with your family across many worlds, you'd be forced to congregate in an open place, a high point, because you'd otherwise be blocked by the trees. But in this particular world, the townsfolk had built their church on the highest point, right in the way. I think these creatures were stepping, gathered on the hilltop, heading east, fleeing away from the worlds further west, like the trolls, stampeding. Suddenly they found themselves here, in this enclosed space with all these humans. They panicked, more and more of them piled in. They killed everybody in here, they broke out, they hunted down everyone, everybody else. Then we get this bit where they find this woman and uh, she's heavily pregnant and the baby's just so big and they're like we can't we can't she's not gonna be able to give birth to this baby joshua hastily shaved the beast's lower stomach then trying to keep a steady hand he held a bronze scalpel over the abdomen wall and just as he was about to cut into the flesh the baby vanished he felt its absence as the womb imploded he sat back in shock it stepped damn it the baby stepped i don't believe it what just happened lobsang sounded exhilarated evolution joshua evolution just happened all upright humanoids have trouble giving birth. You know that, and your mother learned it the hard way. As we evolved, the female pelvis shrank to allow for bipedalism, but at the same time the baby's brain grew bigger, which is why we're born so helpless. We emerge with a lot of growing to do before we're independent. But it appears that in this species, the problem with the pelvis has been sidestepped, literally. He laughed gently. Here the baby isn't born through the birth canal. It steps out of the womb, Joshua. Placenta, umbilical and all, I imagine. It makes sense. An ability to step must shape all aspects of a creature's life ways if you give evolution time to exploit it. And if you don't have to go to all the trouble of being born, your brain can get as big as you like. 
And Joshua then realised if he'd opened her up, the mother wouldn't have survived the wound that he'd inflicted. So he almost murdered her for no reason. Because he just didn't understand. They uh, find these giant mushrooms as well. And Lobsang says that a few pounds of the flesh of the giant mushrooms contained enough proteins, vitamins and minerals to keep a human alive for weeks. Although in culinary terms, totally bored. However, he added, something that grows so quickly contains all the nutrients a human being needs and can flourish more or less anywhere is undoubtedly something for the fast food industry to take an interest in. Always glad to help Trans Earth make a quick book, Lobsang. We get a character called Nelson introduced as well, who becomes more important in the book that I'm reading at the moment. I flagged this page here where he's introduced, but only for this little bit that I quite like. His mother had raised him in Jesus, as she put it, and for her sake he persevered, and in the end, after a somewhat complicated career and a still more complicated philosophical journey, he took holy orders. Eventually he was invited to Britain to bring the good news to the heathen, proof positive that what goes around comes around. He quite liked the English. They tended to say sorry a lot, which was quite understandable given their heritage and the crimes of their ancestors. Sorry about that, yeah, very true though. Okay, so Nelson is meeting the Reverend Blessed here, and the Reverend Blessed goes, I don't really formulate in any sort of position whatsoever until it was definitively announced that there were indeed other Earths, millions of them, as close to us as a thought, and apparently ours for the taking. Now that made ears pick up around here. It was about land. In the countryside, land gets attention. He looked into his brandy glass, saw that it was empty and shrugged. In short, I must say, I found myself wondering, what hath God wrought? Book of Numbers, said Nelson instinctively. Well done, Nelson. And also, rather pleasingly, they were the first official words sent by Samuel Morse over the electric telegraph in 1838. So I just like with this book, there's all this extra information that you just read as part of the narrative, but that educates you as well. It's cool. We have this moment where uh, Joshua asks, who's Ray Harryhausen and what's a showreel? And Lobsang replies with, tonight's movie will be the original version of Jason and the Argonauts, followed by an illustrated talk. So I'm assuming that, Harry, that Ray Harryhausen was the guy who did the stop motion animation on Jason and the Argonauts. Yeah, he was an artist and he pioneered stop motion animation and made his own uh, uh, like genre of it, I suppose. And if you've ever seen Jason and the Argonauts with a da 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 and then, the, and then the skeletons are all like, Aah! okay. So, uh, and then Joshua discovers that Sally, who's like, they they like work together, and there's actually tension in this second book because she, Sally comes back, and obviously Joshua's married by this point. But Sally's father was uh, Willis Lindsay, the guy who invented the stepper device, and she says, "All right, you want the full story? I'm from a family of steppers, natural steppers. Oh, close your mouth, Joshua. My grandfather could step, my mother could step, and I can step." My father couldn't step, however, and that's why he needed to invent something like the stepper box. So he did. I first stepped when I was four, and I soon found out that Dad could step if he was holding my hand. They took a photograph of us. I never had any problem with it, the magic door stuff, because of Mum. Mum was a reader and she read to me Tolkien and Larry Niven and E. Nesbitt and just about everything else. I was homeschooled, needless to say. And I grew up with my own Narnia. And she's kind of reluctant to share the stepwise worlds with other people because obviously she grew up with them and they were just hers and now everybody else is kind of muscling in. And it's interesting because I've been reading Narnia. I actually read two of the Narnia books between reading these two here. So, And it says that uh, her dad was uh, a hippie born of hippies. And so... Um, when he, when he released the technology, he kind of knew it was going to cause chaos, but he, uh, his daughter says, Although he said people were going to have to learn to think out there in the long earth. He said once, I'm giving mankind the key to endless worlds, an end to scarcity and, may we hope, war, and perhaps a new meaning to life. I leave the exploration of all these worlds to your generation, my dear, though personally I think you will fuck it up royally. We also have this place called Happy Landings, which is a sort of people magnet, so it's in one of the stepwise worlds, but a lot of people just accidentally end up there. And so it says here, Of course, many of the population you see around you were born here. I myself was. But there is always a trickle of newcomers. None of those incoming settlers knows how they got here, and everybody who comes here fresh arrives with the same story. One day you're on Earth, the datum as they call it now, minding your own business, and suddenly you're here. Sometimes there's stress involved, you're trying to escape something, sometimes not. He lowered his voice and added, Sometimes there are lone children, strays, lost boys and lost girls, even infants. Often they've never stepped before at all. They're always made welcome, you may be sure of that. We also hear about the Long Song, which is the, the trolls, basically, which are these creatures from another world. They have this song that they pass from one to another across the worlds as well, and it's kind of like a detailed version of their history. And uh, Lobsang says, I detect patterns in the music. It will take some time to analyse. Good luck with that, mister, Sally said. I have known trolls for years, and I can only guess what they're talking about. 
But I'm pretty confident that in this case they're discussing us in the airship, and by nightfall, every troll on this continent will be repeating it until they all have it perfect. The songs represent a sort of shared memory, that's what I believe. There's even a sort of checksum in the songs, I think, a self-correction mechanism, so that in time all the trolls get the same information reliably. Eventually it will probably go worlds wide, depending on troll migration patterns. Sooner or later, every troll that can be reached will know that we were here today. And what I particularly like about that is that that makes it basically blockchain. It's ba they're basically the trolls are using blockchain to share message, like share a song that shares messages across worlds. Incredible ideas. I'm going to read this little paragraph here. So the trolls don't like large concentrations of human beings. Later that morning, Joshua learned that this fact, the size of the townships, was of intense interest to a young man called Henry. He had been raised among Amish until one day he stepped into a diff soft place and landed, as it were, among a different kind of chosen. It seemed to Joshua that Henry had come to terms with this elevation quite happily. He explained to Joshua that back home his people had always reckoned that around 150 people was just the right size for a caring community, and so he felt at home here. He always thought, however, that he had died and that Happy Landings was, if not heaven, at least a staging post for the journey outwards. Being dead didn't seem to bother him very much. He had his place in this little society. He was a good husbandman, gentle around animals, and particularly fond of trolls. Now that number as well, 150, that's Dunbar's number. He's like an evolutionary psychologist, I want to say, called Robin Dunbar. And he's done some research that, that suggests that the maximum number of actual friendships anyone can have is 150. As soon as you start to try and have more friendships like than that, then previous friendships start to go like unmaintained and die away. A bit like, you know, on The Sims, when you're constantly having to befriend people to get promotions. And then if you don't spend time with them, you have to make friends with them again. And so uh, then Lobsang is talking about the trolls and he's given them a name. Homo habilis, handyman, the first toolmakers in the human evolutionary line. You see, I'm speculating that maybe the stepping ability evolved alongside the ability to make tools. One surely needs a similar imaginative capacity to imagine how a bit of stone might become an axe, to imagine how one world might differ from another and then to step into it. Or perhaps it is related to the ability to imagine alternative futures depending on one's choices. To go hunting today, or to go back to that rich hazel clump again. Either way, once such an ability developed, the species would split between increasingly adept steppers who would drift away, and those less adept or unable to step at all, who would stay at home, and perhaps become actively resistant to the steppers, who would have a competitive advantage. And then Joshua suggests that that's what happened, a stay-at-home strand that gave rise to humanity on datum Earth. So that's why humans can't step and why all humans are on the same earth as well. We have this nice little, uh, this little exchange here. Good morning, Sally, Lobsang said. I trust you are rested. The best thing about the beer at Happy Landings is its purity, like the very best German brews, no hangover. Now, I would argue, like all German brews, because Germany actually has a purity law where they can only put, I think it's three or four ingredients in the beer, and it's like hops, yeast, water and sugar or whatever it is that you need to make uh, beers and so all German beers only use those four ingredients so they're all super pure and it was also very nice for me as a vegan going to Germany because it means none of them have been processed with Isinglass or anything like that which is you know fish bladder basically which a lot of beer is processed through so yeah German beer for the win oh there's a, a reference here just uh, this line there were slopes of scree at the base of the canyon walls and I've still been trying to figure out what scree is because when I was a kid, my uncle used to be stuck on one of those old like uh, adventure games where you had to type in like pick up key or whatever, and he got stuck at a scree slope. So answers in the comments if you know what a scree slope is, because it's been bugging me for ages. And I even Googled it and didn't really get a satisfactory answer. I think it's just like the side of a hill where there's like loose rocks. Okay, and we have Brian Cowley who is basically uh, anti-stepping and uh, like almost runs a political campaign against it, so I'm going to read you part of his speech here. Natural steppers. Such a nice phrase, ain't it? I mean, we all step. We all learn to do it when we're weaned off our mammy's milk. Oh look, it's baby's first steps. Brian Cowley, who is nothing if not a showman, took mincing baby paces back and forth across the stage, mic in hand, picked out by the spotlights in the cavernous conference room. The simple stunt won him a few whoops. Monica Jansen, in plain clothes, glanced around the crowd in this basement room to see who was doing the whooping. It's natural, walking is, but what they call stepping, he shook his head. Nothing natural about that. You need a gadget to do it, don't you? You don't need no gadget to walk. Stepping, that's not what I call it. That's not what my granddaddy would have called it. 
We plain folk, who don't have the education to know any better, have other words for practices like that. Words like unnatural, words like abomination, words like unholy. And he points out as well that uh, he says, uh, some of them even have homes standing empty. You know how many people are homeless in America today? And I can see that happening, like, although it does say it's mainly, uh, it's mainly the poor pe poorer people who step away because the richer people have got something to lose. They have all these assets on our earth. But um, with people leaving their homes, I can totally see an America in which it, they still won't let homeless people use them. You know, it's crazy. And then there's another creature. So we have the trolls and we have the elves as well. And it should be pointed out, they're not like fantasy trolls and elves. It's just a name that people use for them. And so Sally's saying here, I think in some of the colonies, they call them greys after the old UFO mythology. You see them everywhere in the high megas and sometimes in the lower worlds. They're generally leery of humans, but they will try their luck if you're isolated or wounded. Super fast, super strong, highly intelligent hunters who use stepping when they go for their prey. I know, Joshua said. We've met them before. Elves. Not a bad name when you think about it. Elves weren't always sweet little creatures, were they? Northern European legends portray them as tall and powerful and quite without souls. A nasty name. I can live with that. They need all the bad press we can give them. And in mythology, aren't elves often afraid of iron? No wonder, I guess. Iron could be used to trap them, to stop them from stepping. And indeed, in The Long War, which I'm reading at the moment, there are some governments that are like forcing people to have operations that attaches like a, stra a little slip of iron to their hearts, so that if they do step, the iron will let be left behind and they'll die. And then the airship goes into something called the gap, and it's nothing pure nothing. It's basically where the Earth was, but in this version of The Long World, the Earth has been destroyed. And... Uh, that causes problems, as you can imagine, for people who want to step from either side. I like this little conversation here as well. That evening, as they relaxed as best they could while the ship stepped cautiously on, Lobsang startled Joshua by talking about access to space. I've been thinking, what an opportunity the gap represents. Since the galley was mostly inoperative, Joshua was hammering a grill out of a defunct piece of equipment. An opportunity for what? Space travel. You could just put on a pressure suit and step off into space. None of that messy business of climbing out of Earth's gravity while on rockets. You'd presumably be in solar orbit just as Earth is. Once you had some kind of infrastructure in place in the gap itself, you could simply sail off. It would be a great deal more energy efficient to get to Mars, say. I, so, and so I guess if you built something in the gap, it would orbit the sun at the same rate as the Earth. And so when you step from the Earth, it would still be there. And that actually makes me think as well, imagine if there's... A version, maybe that, maybe that Earth isn't missing, it's just a version of the Earth in which it orbits the Sun slightly faster. And, you know, the difference in that rotational spin or whatever, that would cause it. That would be enough to cause you to step out into the gap. And then they meet this big creature called First Person Singular, which I think is a great name. But I don't want to say too much about it because that does tie in quite heavily with just the sort of standalone storyline of this. I think the rest of the stuff doesn't matter, it's not too much of a spoiler, you know? And, uh... Yeah, that, that, I think each book so far has got its own kind of internal plot and then the wider plot as well. We have this bit here as well. They would never know how a band of trolls has ended up on that remote world, Joshua realised. They must have come through the gap. Perhaps they were traumatised, some of them injured by exposure to vacuum. And then they end up on the world of first person singular, who can't go past the gap and that may just be a good thing. This will be a little bit of a spoiler about the entity of the first person singular, but I'm assuming if you've watched to this point, you're not too worried about spoilers, so... um Sally's face was ashen, but for the likes of us, she represents a termination. She brings the end of individuality, ultimately, to every earth she touches. And the end of evolution, Lobsang said gravely. The end of the world, in a sense. The end of world after world as she works her way along the chain of the long earth. Sally said, she is a destroyer of worlds, an eater of souls. If the trolls sensed any of this, no wonder they were terrified. Then uh, there's an attempt to ha basically to hack Lobsang. Uh, and he says, nothing has been taken, nothing was changed, but I believe that some memory stores have been accessed and copied, Sally asked, such as. Information about the trolls, about stepping. It backs up the story you were given, Joshua, but this is a very partial hypothesis. For me, it is like trying to recover a memory. Sally said, was it a vision or a waking dream? They stared at her and she blushed and snapped defiantly. What? So I know Keats. Lots of people know Keats. My grandfather often recited Keats. Although he always used to spoil it by saying afterwards that he loved Keats, but had never actually seen a Keat. Which I, I rather enjoy. And then Lobsang basically goes off on like a suicide mission, which is interesting for a computer, I suppose. It's interesting because Lobsang says, uh, well it says here, He stared at Sally and felt the bewilderment he saw in her face. He said, First person singular scared me. And there were times when Lobsang scared me too, though for different reasons. 
the thought of the two of them together and what they might become. Maybe that's a hint for what's going to come later in the series. Also, there's a cat on board the uh, ship they're exploring on in case they have to deal with vermin. And uh, so we get a great example of... <laughs> this is just a great characterization of cats in general. You're not some avatar of Lobsang, are you? I did hope we'd got rid of him. The cat looked up from licking her paw. No, although I too am a gel-based personality. Adapted for light conversation, proverbs, rodent, securement, and incidental chit-chat with a 31% bias towards cynicism. I am, of course, a prototype, but will shortly be one of a new line of pets available from the Black Corporation. Tell your friends. And now, if you'll excuse me, my work is as yet incomplete. And then the cat walks out. It's the kind of thing Biggie would say if he could talk. Okay, we do have another massive, massive uh, spoiler that I could share. It involves Rod Green, who is... He's a non-stepper, and his family leave him behind on Earth, and he basically gets increasingly involved with, like, uh, what you would call, um, like, extremism, I guess. So there's, like, an extreme anti-stepping movement where they protest against, uh, you know, the, the all of the other worlds. And uh, let's just say he perpetrates a terrorist attack, and uh, there is a moment here. If you can imagine that we had warning of the World Trade Centers, but it was too late, and there were people on the World Trade Center trying to get down the elevators, and they couldn't get there in time. And so, as a last resort, they stepped into another world. But obviously, the building doesn't exist in another world, so it says here. And in the very last second, she saw, in a view from ground level, that where the high-rise buildings of downtown stood, people started appearing in midair. Many were in business suits. They just stepped over from the upper floors because there was no time left to get to the elevator or the stairs or do anything else. Three-dimensional ghosts of the doomed buildings coalesced. Ghosts composed of people who seemed to hang in the air just for an instant before falling to the ground. So there is some darkness to this, you know. One final thing here I want to read is the acknowledgements, and this is December 2011 in Our Earth. We chose to use Madison, Wisconsin as a location in this novel, partly because as we were developing the book, it occurred to us that in July 2011, the second North American Discworld convention was to be held there, and we could get a hell of a lot of research done, as we authors like to say, on the cheap. That convention became in part a kind of mass workshop on the long earth. We're grateful to all the contributors to that discussion, who really are far numerous to list here, but particularly to Dr. Christopher Pagel, owner of the Companion Animal Hospital in Madison, and his wife Julia Pagel, who gave up an unreasonable amount of their time to show your authors Madison both primeval and modern, from the Arboretum to Willie Street, and on top of that made an incredibly helpful read-through of a draft of this book. Thank you Madisonians, and we hereby apologise for what we have done to your lovely city. All errors and inaccuracies are of course our sole responsibility. Our thanks also to Charles Manson, the Tibetan subject librarian at the Bodleian Library Oxford, for helping us to build Lobsang's world. Now I've been to the Bodleian, it's not far from where Bex lives. So yeah, we have reached the end of this review. As you can tell from how much I've talked about this book, I really, really enjoyed it. I gave it a 5 out of 5, and it is in the running for my top book of the year so far, and I really can't wait to read the rest of the series. I was hesitant going into it, and I think part of that is because the blurb really doesn't sell what this book is about. But uh, yeah, I'm very glad that I read it. And I mean, I'm already reading book two and I look forward to finishing the series. So there we have it. That's what I thought of The Long Earth by Terry Pratchett and Stephen Baxter. As always, be sure to let me know in the comments if you've read this book and if so, what you thought of it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe for more and I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.